Hi, welcome to Stat Stuff. I'm Matt Hansen. In this lesson, we're going to review the steps you can follow for applying a variety of lean tools and concepts in a lean workout, also known as a Kaizen event. Since many of the lean tools and concepts are used in a lean workout, it will be very helpful to first review all those prior lessons on lean. As well, this lesson will briefly discuss an implementation plan, which is discussed in more detail in a Six Sigma Improved lesson about building a pilot plan. So for now, let's begin by defining what a lean workout is. A lean workout is an extended meeting that lasts over several days that's focused on trying to improve the process using a lot of the lean tools and concepts. Again, it can last anywhere from one to five days for a typical type of workout, and the length of the days really depends on the scale or complexity of the process that you're trying to improve. Now, a workout will allow you to use many of the different types of lean tools and concepts all within one type of setting. The workout is often referred to as like a Kaizen event. Kaizen is the Japanese term for the word improvement. Now, Kaizen is usually referred to as the philosophy of doing continuous improvement. A Kaizen event is usually that one event that in time that's usually the concentrated effort where all the process stakeholders get together to try to improve the process within that short period of time. Now, the workout like this should include all the stakeholders who are critical to the process that you're trying to improve. And the whole goal of the workout is that you want to design an improved process with an implementation plan. And that implementation plan is what details all the actions, the owners responsible for those actions, the due dates for when they're going to deliver those actions, and so on, for all of the processes, all, I'm sorry, all the improvements that you want to make to the process itself. Now, what's the overall process for the lean workout? And what does that look like? What I want to show are the basic steps that you might follow, and I'll outline the steps using the IPO flow model, which is the input process output flow model. So we'll basically show it like the input to the workout, and then the process itself during the workout, and then the output that you'd expect from the workout, broken out over five basic steps. Starting first with, as an input, you want to define the problem and the scope of the workout. You want to have that identified before the workout begins. That's why it's considered to be an input. And the process for the workout itself would begin with taking that defined problem and scope of what you're going to target, and then you would begin with building the as-is process map, or starting with the value stream map, something that shows the as-is for the current process. And next, you want to identify and measure any waste. Identify all the non-value added steps that are within the process. And then after you've identified that, you want to build the 2B process, or like a 2B value stream map, something that shows the, the 2B state, where you want to be in the future after you've identified these elements of waste that you want to remove from the process. Then the output that you would get from that whole workout itself would be an implementation plan, something that lays out these are the actual steps and actions we want to take in order to implement these improvements to our process. Okay, now that you can see that there are just five basic steps for a leading a lean workout that were applied to the IPO model, let's break each of those steps down into much more detail. Let's begin by looking at the first step that's part of the inputs into this lean workout process. Well, that first step that's the input into the workout is where you want to define the problem and the scope for the workout itself. So in this first step, it's really essential that you build this before the workout actually begins. And it might be the elements you might normally see within a project charter. And you want to make sure that everyone who's going to be part of the workout, or at least who sponsors the workout, agrees to those elements of the charter. So project charter would include things like a problem statement scope, or identifying the team or the stakeholders who are involved, and what expected benefits you'd want to see from, from the outcome from this workout. Now, the sponsor and champion, they should be agreeing with that charter, and they can help identify any other stakeholders that need to be included within the workout. And it's going to save a lot of time in the workout if you get all the workout participants to review that charter and agree with the charter before you even begin the meeting. It will save you a lot of time. That way you can start the meeting already having that baseline understanding of what you're trying to accomplish and everyone's already in agreement. Otherwise, you might find it taking a whole lot more time if you have to get that agreement during the actual workout itself. Now the meeting should be scheduled and all the team members should be identified ahead of time as well obviously to make sure everyone's prepared for when the workout's going to be and have committed to that that time to be at the workout and participate. Ideally you may not want to include more than 10 people. Uh, it's more ideal if you can get it to five, six, seven people, but if you see yourself at 10 or more, then you probably want to scale back a little bit and make sure you're not having too much overlap between the different folks that are involved or maybe your scope is too big for your process that you're looking at. It's only because when you have too many people involved, it can get a little bit hairy and it might end up taking a whole lot longer in order to make progress during the workout. 
Now the meeting duration for how long it should take is going to depend on the complexity and scale of the process that you're reviewing. So obviously if it's something that's a simple or small type of process it may only be one day. But if you have something that's a lot more complex, a whole lot of sub-processes, or you have a whole bunch of stakeholders, then it may be better to plan for five days. Worst case, if you're planning for five days, which is generally the longest you want to plan for something like this, worst case you may end up ending early, and everyone loves that if you can accomplish it faster than your scheduled time. And it's always better to overestimate the workout duration. Just for that very case, again, you're better off uh, getting done early rather than extending it longer than you need to. Now be sure that you've got the Sponsor and Champions Agreement and that they've dedicated all the resources necessary, the people or whatever other equipment or whatever it is you're needing throughout the duration of the workout. It's essential that those people be involved throughout the entire time. Now that's basically what you'd want to see as an input to the workout itself. So now for the actual workout, the process that you'd follow during the workout, well before you actually get into that next step that we identified, you, you're going to start the workout with basically like a meeting kickoff. This is where you're going to get the sponsor champion usually to come in and you want them to kick it off and, and also to return at the end to review the results of the workout itself. This way they're kind of sandwiching in around the workout that they're involved, they're seeing what you started with and helping to kick it off, but they're also uh, agreeing at the end to come back and review the results to make sure that you've got their buy-in with the output that you've created with your team through the workout. Now, the sponsor and champion should try to reinforce the need for the workout, why the folks are dedicating their time to being there, and reinforce the commitment that they want to get from the team and their participation in the workouts. So that's why it's so essential you at least get the sponsor and or the champion involved as a, in the meeting kickoff. So the next big step actually the first step of what you'd normally see within the process of doing the workout is where you're trying to build the as-is process map or the as-is value stream map or VSM. So the as-is process map is extremely critical to the success of the workout. You gotta make sure you map it out correctly right up front. The team is going to be um, unfamiliar with the process mapping, possibly. And if they are, then you might want to walk through some sort of icebreaker to explain how to build a process map. But if they're already familiar with what a process map looks like and how to build it, then you may not even have to go through that icebreaker exercise. And this type of uh, element within the, the process of the workout itself is probably going to take the longest. You're probably going to spend the most time in building this as-is map. You might find the surprise, to your surprise, that there are a lot of folks who have disagreement over how the process actually works. And a lot of folks tend to be very surprised when they, they learn from their peers and the other stakeholders involved of how the process works because they might have been so ingrained with their one piece, not realizing what happens upstream or downstream from them. But it's really essential that you make sure you spend enough time to get a full process map at the level of detail that you need and that's accurate and everyone agrees to what you've identified in the as-is process map. Now, this as-is process mapping, it may require that you divide your team up into different groups so that each person is focusing on, or I'm sorry, each of those, those groups are focusing on maybe some sub-processes. If you find there's a lot of complexity and you've got some of these sub-processes, you might find that it's really worthwhile to break them up into groups like that. I mean, you're probably able to get more done in less time by doing that because you're focusing on these sub-processes simultaneously by these different groups. And then what you can do is have each of those groups brief out their results and how they mapped it out to the rest of the team. And then you might find they're, they may not be perfect, they might have not have identified everything, but in the end it'll, and it'll operate much faster if you can have them uh, break out into groups like that. Now that's going to be necessary if you find there's a lot of delays or complexity with what you're looking at. It's not always required, but it is a helpful hint of uh, helping to be successful and making it faster as you, you build this as-is process map. Now what you're going to build, is it going to be a process map or a value stream map or VSM? Build a process map if you're trying to improve the quality or the accuracy in the process that might include communication or handoffs between different groups. But instead, if you're trying to focus on improving the cycle times or efficiencies in the process, or you have more tangible type of items that you're handling, then the value stream map might be more ideal for that. Um, but if you're not sure which one to use, I tend to favor starting with a process map and see where it goes from there. If you find that you're needing more emphasis on the efficiency side of things and tracking times, and if it tends to, to look like it's something that's better fitting for value stream map, then it's probably easier to migrate from a process map to a value stream map. 
that's my personal experience. Other folks might have different experiences. Go with whatever is comfortable for you. But at least in my experience, I found that this is when you might want to use one over the other. And again, if you're not sure, I tend to favor you starting off with the process map and going from there. Now that you have a good as-is process map, you'll want to explore that in more detail in this third step of identifying and measuring waste within the current process. Now in this third step of working through the workout, uh, this is where you want to identify and measure the waste within the as-is process that you had just built in that prior step. So if you've got the entire as-is process map laid out, identify any value-added or non-value-added steps that might exist within the as-is process map. And then you might want to make those notations about whether it's value-added, non-value-added, or even non-value-added but required. Then you would review the as-is map across the seven deadly wastes, which are uh, broken out as tin wood. So for each type of waste that you're working through, walk through the entire as-is map and ask for each of those process steps if that type of waste happens to exist. So you would notate then, as you walk through the process map, each of those wastes that you've identified. So for example, you could identify different types of color codes for flagging each type of waste, where you can say, all right, now for transportation as the first type of waste among the seven deadly wastes, let's go through each step at a time. Is there any transportation waste that we're identifying in this step? Then we move down to the next step. Is there any transportation waste we see within here? And you can walk through the entire process map and take it from the perspective of one type of waste. After you've gone through that, then you can go back again and start to identify then any other steps for like inventory, then motion, or any of these different types of, of waste to see if they exist within the process. So you can begin to flag each of those using some stickers or color coding just to highlight them so they stand out. And then with each one, you can also identify something like an H and M and L that stands for the H being the high probability of being able to measure that type of waste, or M being the medium probability for being able to measure it, or L being the low probability for measuring that particular type of waste. That way you can see where you might have the best opportunity to measure the different types of waste that you're identifying. So according to this example that we're seeing off to the right, if you've gone through and we identified transportation using a green type of sticker, then you might note, all right, well, for this particular step in the process, we do see some transportation waste, and it looks like there's a high probability that we can measure that. However, in this next step, off to the left-hand side, there's also some transportation waste here, but we're not as likely to get some measurement. Maybe it's only a medium probability of, of finding some measurement of the waste within that particular step of the process. And you can continue to work through that. Every step where you identify a certain type of process, just try to identify then what the probability is of finding some measurement for that type of waste that you're seeing. And then if you see anything that might be some potential waste as you talk through this, but it's not specifically within the process itself, then you might want to identify those in a parking lot, a separate item off to the side. So at least you're identifying the waste, but if it's not relevant to the actual as-is map or can't be mapped in this way, then at least you've got to identify it in the separate parking lot. And I would also try using other lean tools uh, to help find some additional waste, for example, like a spaghetti diagram. And then you can also select the process steps that have the greatest potential of waste that have been noted. Now that you've walked through this exercise, go through it and see, for example, which one of those steps have more H's on them. So in the example that's illustrated here, I might want to focus on this process that is at the decision point because there's more waste that seems to be occurring there and um, most of those have a medium or high probability of some sort of measurement. So that might be a great opportunity compared to maybe this other decision point where it has a high and but there is a low probability for another type of waste we're seeing and there's probably less waste that we're seeing there. So at least it can give you some sort of target of where you might want to focus first and find the greatest opportunity of waste. And next you might want to measure the potential waste identified for each of those different process steps. That is, if you're focusing on efficiency, which is the improvement of the timeliness or the overall flow of items going through the process, uh, and then calculate the cycle times or wait time, value added time, everything associated with time, those types of things can be really helpful if you're trying to improve the efficiency of the process. However, if you're trying to focus on the effectiveness, the accuracy or quality of items flowing through the process, then you might want to use instead the type of measure like a full a first time yield or roll throughput yield or measuring the work in process or that kind of thing. 
and then also look for after you've identified this eliminate any overlapping measured waste that you might see that is if you see an opportunity that might cause multiple forms of waste for example this decision point one that has multiple forms are identified you want to make sure that you're not duplicating your measurements in, in any way so if you see one thing is measured but it's also the same type of measurement that reflects multiple types of waste or it's overlapped just make sure you're not double counting that or triple counting it simply because you've you separately categorize it as a different waste. If it's really just one measurement or, or one set of instances for that type of waste, then make sure you've only accounted for that once as necessary. And finally, make sure that you normalize all the waste that you've measured. For example, when you're calculating the waste for each of these steps, make sure that the calculations and whatever methods or values that you're using, for example, if you're doing it in dollars or you're measuring it down to minutes or seconds in your time or whatever way it is, try to be consistent in that same type of measurement across all the process steps. So if you're finding that it's easier to measure things in minutes at one layer for one step, but maybe in a different step it's better to measure it in seconds, well then you probably want to go back to the one that's in minutes and convert it to seconds anyway. At, the, at least that way it will be consistent so that as you're comparing one to the other, they're all normalized with each other. So you can see compared to each step to each other and all the potential waste that you're finding, you can really see which ones stand out as the greatest opportunity for improvement. Hopefully you now have the as-is process map all marked up from identifying many forms of waste. Next, in this fourth step, you want to redesign that process by building a 2B process map. This fourth step can be a lot of fun for folks as we're trying to now build the 2B process map or the 2B value stream map. So now that we've got the as-is map where we identified all the waste and we've measured it hopefully at this point, now it's going to be a lot easier to build that 2B process map. So in order to build that, first we want to make sure that we preserve the as-is map and we don't make any changes to it. We want to make sure we keep it as our guide as we're building the 2B process map. So we've got this process map, the as-is one, already marked up. Make sure it stays in that state or we've got a picture of it we can refer to. We're transferring the content to something like Visio or PowerPoint. In some way we want to make sure that we we don't lose sight of what that as-is process map look like. And we want to also flow through the as-is map from beginning to end and try to replicate all the process steps for the new 2B process map that we're trying to build. We want to eliminate each of those non-value-added steps and we want to make sure that the preceding and subsequent steps can be linked. So although, like in this example here, we might see that it's obvious we want to eliminate some of these process steps, by eliminating these altogether, we're automatically connecting this first step to the next one beneath it. So we want to make sure, is there a smooth connection between the two? If there's not, then maybe there was something else that it was a value we didn't realize. So maybe we shouldn't just automatically eliminate these steps. We just want to be careful in how we're transferring the, the movement of this process from the prior step, the preceding one, to the subsequent step for those non-value-added steps that we're getting rid of. So just got to be cautious of that. Now for each of those value-added process steps that are remaining, where we have identified some waste, we want to try to discuss how that waste can be removed. So if we're seeing that within an existing step like these that we said are value-added and we want to keep them, we also identified some waste in them. So when we build a new 2B process map, we're building it with those value-added steps that we've kept before. We want to make sure as we're building the 2B process map, we're accounting for the existing waste that we've already identified. So that way the new process map, the 2B state, is not going to include those elements. So just be careful on how we build that to make sure we've tried to eliminate as much as the, of that waste and non-value-added steps as much as possible. Now once all the steps are already built on the 2B process map, we also want to identify any unnecessary cross-functional waste that may exist. This is where we might use some swim lanes or a spaghetti diagram or something like that, some of those tools to help us in understanding as we're working through the 2B process map in this new state that we're trying to build, is there any kind of motion or transportation that's unnecessary where, where whatever it is that we're processing, whether it's a transaction or an actual um, product or something that we're building, something that's tangible or even intangible. So we want to make sure we're not creating waste in this new process because we didn't have the same type of set, set up in the as-is process. So just be aware and make sure that as you're, you can track the motion or track the, the different movement or transportation of items through the new 2B process, we want to make sure we're not creating any additional waste like that. So in such cases, we want to explore the necessity of that motion and new ways that we might want to reduce it or try to eliminate it if possible. 
And then also we want to apply to the new to be process map any other lean tools or concepts that could help. For example, we want to make sure that we might include a 5S plan in there so that way things are, we have a sort and shine and those, those types of elements are accounted for in the new to be process. We want to make sure that it's more of a pull kind of system and we've got the right kind of visual cues like a Kanban system to help uh, keep the movement flowing through the process or that we've got Pokio built into certain critical steps so we've got that mistake proofing in there so we can prevent those kinds of errors that might have occurred in the as is process before. Now when you build this try to review the entire 2B process map with the entire team and try to make sure that the whole flow is logical and it meets the customers ultimate expectations and requirements that they've set and try to make sure you review that map with any of the stakeholders who aren't in the workout. Those people that it might sound good in the meeting but for those who aren't in the meeting uh, we want to make sure that they also agree especially if they're considered to be a critical stakeholder. So it might be necessary at this point to at least reach out to some of those experts in the different areas that could be affected either upstream or downstream from this entire process to make sure that we're not actually hurting them in what, what they're getting in the process. Something we identify maybe as non-value added Maybe non-value added to us, but maybe it's value added for someone else that's downstream from us. So we just have to make sure we account for that in our 2B process to make sure it's the right process design. Well, I hope you have a good, solid 2B process that the team is excited about implementing. But building the 2B process map isn't enough. In the fifth and final step, you'll need to talk with your team about defining specific actions you need to take in order to successfully implement the new 2B process. Now this last step in the workout can often be one of the most critical because it's building this implementation plan like the example shown here that really takes the design of the new process and it puts some meat around it. It turns it into some sort of action and it's what helps it actually get implemented. So here's an example of what an implementation plan might look like. Now the actual steps for building an implementation like this uh, go into a lot more detail in a separate lesson that's covered in the improve phase set of lessons. Uh, but it, this example right now, I'm going to show you just a few basic steps of what the layout looks like for building an implementation plan. So these steps are just briefly going to cover it and how we can adapt it to the lean workout. And it begins with first we want to compare the as is and the to be maps. Those two maps that we've got created now. I want to compare them with one another and find what are the critical gaps between those two processes that we've designed. Each of those gaps are things that we want to identify as a unique action of something that needs to be implemented within this implementation plan. So here are the improvements we might identify here as here's the first action. Uh, and then here's another action because these are the unique gaps that we're seeing between the two different process maps. Now it's okay if there's one major gap that needs to be identified as multiple unique actions. That's perfectly okay. But just make sure you've at least identified the all the possible gaps out there and how you want to break those out into different types of actions and within one action or across multiple actions. That's completely up to you as long as all those gaps are covered and somehow converted to a, an action. For each of those actions that you've identified, you might see that there are actually sub-actions you might need to follow in order to make that overall action occur. So in this particular example of the implementation plan, you might have an overall action like action 2 here, but you might break that down into sub-actions, A, B, C, D, and so on. All the things necessary, those sub-actions that are required in order to complete this high-level action. So make sure you identify all those steps along the way. Uh, also, you want to identify any priorities or prerequisites for uh, each of these different sub actions as well. For example, for the priority, here's where you want to say is this what what is the priority for this type of action? Is it high, medium, or low? And what is maybe the prerequisite for the action? In this column here, for example, we might be referencing other actions where one sub action cannot be complete unless another prior sub action is done or maybe another sub action in a completely different high level action is completed. So at least having this kind of layout can help you. Now there's other tools, uh, project management tools that can help in this type of situation for laying out an implementation plan similar to this and they get into a lot more complexity like using Microsoft Project or similar tools or even like building out a Gantt chart. Those things are great and helpful. This might be one example of a, a pretty straightforward way you can lay out real simplistically like this and you can always convert it to one of those other tools if you find that it's necessary. So for each of these sub-actions, again, we want to make sure that we've at least identified all these critical things also like the area where 
the people are the, where this particular action is going to be accomplished and who's the owner who's responsible for it and what's the amount of time that might be required for that action to occur and what's the due date that we might expect for this action to be complete all these things can be extremely helpful in identifying as you're planning for these actions so you can see how long it takes for the overall the overall um, implementation of all these improvements to get to that 2B process that you're trying to build. And finally, you want to make sure that you review the implementation plan with your sponsor and champion and any other stakeholders who might be involved in the process. You need to get their agreement. Now again, we've talked before about how the sponsor or champion should be there as a kickoff to the meeting, but it's also good to bring them back at the end of the meeting. And this is the kind of thing that you want to show to them. You want to be able to show them your as-is map that you identified. And then you also want to show them your 2B process map that you built. But then ultimately what you want to hand off to them is this implementation plan. Something that takes those designs and again puts action to it. So that way you have some plan with some dates and you've got commitments from all the necessary stakeholders for making sure these actions are completed and by completing those actions you're essentially saying your 2B process will then be in place. Alright, before we close this lesson let's discuss how we can apply some of these concepts in a practical way. Well, first I would recommend that you look at the processes that you interact with on a regular basis and try to identify the ones that might be relatively small or something that's fully in your control, but something you think that could be ideal for some sort of improvement. I would recommend that you take one or two of those processes and try to follow some of these lean workout steps on your own for the processes that are within your control. And by doing this will help you get comfortable with how this lean workout might work if you, or how these steps might work within the process of following a lean workout. Now again, it's all going to be you. You might be your own sponsor for this particular effort. But the idea is here for you to get comfortable with how the process works within the lean workout. But then after you've done that and you get comfortable with it, I'll challenge you to take that a step further. What are the other processes that might be a part of what you touch or maybe within your control or maybe not within your control, but something that you think is on a larger scale and might be ripe for improvement? Or for those kinds of things, I would try to investigate a little bit further and see if a lean workout might help in trying to streamline that particular process. And as you do that and research that, you might want to ask who are those people who are the sponsors for that particular effort and will that sponsor allow you to lead a lean workout using these examples in here. Try to talk to that sponsor to get their support and see if they'll let you lead a lean workout and then try to follow the remaining steps for planning and leading the workout as we've outlined in this particular lesson. Well that wraps up this lesson. Check out statstuff.com for many more resources that can help you achieve powerful results. I'm Matt Hansen. Thanks for watching.